let's move um, on to our next unit. So what we'll be talking about this week is granular media filtration. And I use granular media as the adjective because we will talk later about membrane filtration. So I wanna distinguish between what we refer to as granular media versus membrane filtration. We'll look at a brief overview. Um, we'll look at media uh, characteristics. We'll look at some theory. Much of what we do, will do will be actually focused on the hydraulics of both filtration and what we refer to as backwashing. <clears throat> so when we talk about granular media filtration, the focus really is on removing suspended solids. So granular media filtration most often follows some sort of co <clears throat> coagulation, sedimentation, unless it's a very, very pure, um, clear water, in which case we can, you can use direct filtration. But the goal is removing suspended solids. We want to produce high quality drinking water and we want to remove bacteria. So typically, okay, in drinking water, these are the goals, removing suspended solids, producing high quality drinking water and removing bacteria that hadn't been removed in the previous processes. If we're looking at wastewater, so this is drinking water, we're looking at much of the same predominantly removing suspended solids. And we may also be looking at removing phosphorus that is attached to particulate matter. So those are the predominant goals. We talk, we'll talk about depth or gravity filtration, pressure filtration, and then slow sand filtration. On Tuesday, when Paul spoke with us, he talked about the unit NTU. So N being, anybody remember what N stands for? It's nephilometric. And as Paul mentioned, it's actually Greek for the word cloudy. Neph nephilometric turbidity units is a standardized unit of measuring turbidity or the clarity of water. And what you see here is that we have, I've given you two comparisons. In the US, the drinking water regulations require that the turbidity from the filters be less than 0.3 in 95% of the samples. Contrary, in New Zealand, the turbidity has to be less than one NTUs. Again, it's also for 95%. And then they also have an additional standard in New Zealand, which requires that the turbidity not exceed two NTUs for the duration of any three minute period. So there's both a standard for that 95% and then an upper limit. In the US, there is no upper limit. When we're looking at removal of turbidity using granular media filtration, we're focused in this region here. So we're focused on removing material that is up to about one micron. Just to give you an idea, cryptosporidium oocysts ten, are about three microns in size so we can remove uh, in a well operating filter, we can remove <clears throat> cryptosporidium oasis. So you can see we're looking at the suspended solids. You can see bacteria in this range here. We typically will not get virus removal in a granular media filtration. Viruses are down in this range here. We have to look at other processes if we're looking at virus removal. So with <clears throat> pressure filtration, typically these are used for smaller systems 
um, and high purity water. So you're looking for waters that have less than NT, NTUs in the raw water. And you're looking typically at plants less than about 50 MGD, which is actually still a fairly big size plant. Where I've seen these used most is actually in smaller plants. Williamston um, has a pressure fil filter system. Uh, Mason and Leslie both have pressure filter systems. And the system that MSU put in is essentially a pressure filter system. So instead of relying on gravity to force the water through the filter, you're actually using pressure. You can also use vacuum, pressure is most common. With most of this, you're using some sort of a granular media, so something like sand. These have a much smaller footprint than a uh, gravity filter, and you can operate these often with no chemical addition. Slow sand filters operate with a, under gravity, but with a much lower flow rate. And the difference here is that with slow sand filter, what you form is this layer here of organic matter and microorganisms. It's referred to by its German name, Schmutzdecke, which literally means dirty layer. And so this is a fairly um, thin layer of, <clears throat> as I mentioned, biologically active material. So it includes microorganisms, organic matter. And what happens is in this region here, you get degradation of organic matter. We actually get biological activity. <clears throat> and you get capture of your microorganisms. These are very, very common in Europe. They're used also in much now of the <clears throat> developing world because they don't require pumping, et cetera. And it's just, you're allowing water to flow by, by gravity through this biological layer, then through sand, and then through a gravel support. Much of the removal is actually by sieving. And what will periodically be done is if this layer here gets too thick, then you drain the system, scrape off a bit of that schmutzdecke in order to reduce the thickness of that layer and then refill the unit and operate it again. Gravity filters, also referred to as rapid filters or depth filters, have what is shown here as a layer of our media. And we'll talk more about that but just think of this as sand for now. It has a gravel support. So this is a support layer. It has a series of perforated laterals. These, the water is then collected in these. So these are, this is perforated here. So the water can flow during operation, the water is gonna flow down through this sand into the perforated laterals and then will be collected. During backwashing, the opposite happens. So now we're gonna pump water back upwards. We'll fluidize this bed. So now the water layer will be up over these laterals here. So the water flows into the lateral. So this is during backwashing. This is during operation. So when we're filtering water, it's gonna flow down through the sand 
or other media by gravity down through the support collected in the laterals and then we'll move on to any further treatment. Backwashing, it happens in the opposite direction. This is just another cutout. This shows what's referred to as a gullet. There is another cell here. So these are operated <clears throat> with two cells. So good question, why do they backwash, okay? They backwash for two reasons. One, let's look back here. Okay. If water flows through and that water has turbidity in it, what happens to the head loss over time? So the head loss as a function of time. What will happen is we're operating the system. We have particulates that are removed. So what do you think happens to the head loss as a function of time? It increases, exactly. Okay. At some point, the head loss will become too large in order to allow water to flow through mm -hmm. the filter by gravity. So at that point, we would have to backwash. The other thing, <clears throat> problem is that I mentioned we've got a turbidity limit. As particles collect in the filter, what do you think happens to turbidity? So we're looking at the effluent turbidity as a function of time. Less gets removed, so the turbidity increases. So there's two things that, that trigger backwashing. Either the head loss exceeds some critical limit or the turbidity exceeds some critical limit. In many cases, based on experience, backwashing will actually be done on a timed cycle, just based on knowledge that for instance, every eight hours, it will need to be backwashed rather than watching and then backwashing manually. So this is a cutoff, as I mentioned. Your filters are always designed with two cells. So there's an, here, there's a whole, a J, another system mirror imaged on this side here. And that's because of the pumping and piping requirements. So you can see the skullet in the center. You have your wash troughs here. And this is an air scour system. So often what will happen is on the top of here, you have what we refer to as mud balls. This is basic, these occur predominantly in the surface water system, but basically they're the clay particles aggregate together and they form kind of a clump. And it's really hard to remove those clumps by backwashing. So we often use air scouring to try and dislodge that material. And we'll, you'll see that in in a video in just a bit. So we have these wash troughs. We have, you can see the surface wash unit here. We have the filter media here, a graded gravel support, under drain blocks, and then we have the laterals within that system to this video. It's about five minutes long. I'm gonna play the whole thing. It was actually produced by a colleague um, down at North Carolina State. And I think it's a really good in way to view the operation of the filter. We have the gullet down the middle. And yeah, we can see the drawdown happening. The water is slowly. Okay, so what's happening right now is <clears throat> The 
video starts with backwashing. So the, fil the system, the filter's been operational, but either the head loss limit was exceeded or the turbidity limits were exceeded. And at that point, then this triggers backwashing and the backwashing process actually starts. So the reason for this is, as I mentioned, this is, a, this is clearly a surface water system. So <clears throat> they're using that air scour to try and dislodge material that really has clogged, that's attached, that just simply backwashing the filter wouldn't remove. You can also see in this in <clears throat> video here, back in this region here where I'm pointing to, that's the second cell. So here's your gullet down the center and you have one cell and another cell here. Together, they make up a filter bed. they've done is they've started to pump water and notice here you can kind of you can see here so what's happened is they've fluidized that bed to dislarge particles you want the major the media to remain below the top of the gullets but you can see how violent this mixing is and water is now flowing over the top of these troughs. And that's the, this dirty water okay, that contains all of the removed particulates.
What you see here is a plot of a filter run. So this is a plot of the effluent turbidity and the head loss. And you can see this would be the head loss of the clean filter bed. And then over time, as you operate the system, the head loss filters, and then there would be some Cut off, so this would be our critical head loss. And that's when the run would be terminated and the system backwashed. This is a, a plot of turbidity. Now what you note right here is <clears throat> that the turbidity actually initially increases. And the reason the turbidity increases is what we refer to as filter ripening. So if this is our, these are our sand particles. And so here are our particulates that we're trying to remove. The particulates, this one comes here. And in order to remove particulates, we need two things to happen. We need a collision. So we need collision of the particulates with the, with the media and we need attachment. So that particulate has to, has to collide with the media or the collector and then it has to stick to it. And if it doesn't, it's gonna end up in our effluent. What happens is that as one particle collects, so we have multiple particles, it's more likely that the next particle will attach to it, the removed particle, than it will the media itself. So you actually get in this initial period of time, you get an improved removal. Because of that, and because you need to essentially rinse the filter at the start, there's a certain amount of water that is actually wasted. So that water may not, won't get distributed out to the community because the, the particulate levels are too high. So that becomes wasted. And then we'd start really start maybe here. This is when we would start collecting that water for distribution. And that really depends on the plant. It depends on how well the filters are operating, what, how, what length of time you need to waste that initial amount of water that's treated. Just to compare, slow sand filters with rapid. Typically, we're, we will treat about three to eight meters cubed per meter squared per day. So that meter squared is the surface area of the filters. On the other hand, your velocity through your filters is roughly a hundred times greater in a rapid sand filter, which means in terms of surface area, which one requires the greater surface area. The so slow sand filters are, require much greater surface area than a rapid sand filter. When we're looking at the filtration, much of it occurs in the top 
75 millimeters of a slow sand filter. On the other hand, in a rapid sand filter, you want to use much of the depth of the filter. So you're going to use a lot more of the media for removal. And for slow sand filtration, typically we have single media sand. And for rapid, we can have single media sand. We can have dual media, which is sand, typically sand and anthracite. And we can have multimedia, which typically is sand, anthracite, and garnet. And we use these different media because they have different specific gravities, they have different size and porosities, so we can use them to remove different particles. The anthracite, we can also use, we can have a top media, I mean, above the sand of activated carbon. We're, we're not looking at filtration, but we're really looking at a ab adsorption so, of soluble material. And we'll talk about that when we talk about absorption.